All right, so without further ado, I'm going to, I'm just gonna follow the order that we've listed on the webpage. Uh, so I'm just going to introduce uh, Ezra Wishograd. Am I saying your name correct? Wow, on the first try, very impressive. I'm a linguist, hey, not bad. <laughs> Rarely get that. Uh, Ezra, I'm just gonna uh, ask you to give a quick, uh, brief summary of who you are, what your current uh, job is, and how you got there. Go sure. ahead. Sure. So I would classify myself as an early career, a early career career linguist. Um, I um, had a background academically in linguistics, went to Columbia undergrad, majored in it, um, went to Georgetown um, and got a master's. I entered as in, the, in the PhD program and I left um, shortly after receiving a master's degree. Um, my research interests were in phonetics and phonology. Um, I did field work uh, in West Africa and the Ivory Coast. I did field work uh, for the Kurdish languages as part of the Endangered Language Alliance in New York City when I was at Columbia. Um, I did a little bit of dialectology stuff as well. I did some Boston accent uh, research back home where I'm from. And um, I, um, since grad school, I worked at uh, Expert System USA, which is a sm definitely a smaller company that um, does uh, defense subcontracting, which is uh, Washington DCEs for um, helping uh, the government out with linguistic type problems, um, document categorization, information extraction, things like that. Um, I'm now working at a, a much larger company, of course, uh, Amazon working uh, with Alexa. And I would, I would say caution everyone that hopefully you don't have an Alexa around you turned on because I might be activating a bunch of people's Alexas right now by saying that. Um, but basically in the past few years, I've gone from um, being a grad student, very academically minded to a smaller company to a larger company. So I think I've seen definitely a bunch of different scenes in the past uh, two or three years. Great. Um, so give us a sense of when it, you, you started looking towards industry as a career path. Sure. In grad school? So in grad school, and actually it, it comes back to actually one particular experience I had in grad school where um, at Georgetown, the uh, phonetics phonology people had a reading group every Friday. And we had a particularly, for lack of a better term, gifted um, guest speaker that was coming um, and spoke to us about, um, to geek out a little bit about epithetic vowels in Georgian, which phonetics phonology people love. And um, one of the most brilliant talks I've ever heard in my life, linguistics or otherwise. and. Afterwards, we came to talk about her uh, struggles in finding a job in academia. And it was incredibly disheartening because this was one of the smartest people I've ever met. She had applied all over the world without exaggerating to all these different departments in the English and French speaking world to try to find an academic position. And she was telling us, you know, there's maybe three, four or five jobs that might come up in a particular season that are tenure track in next phonology. And it was so disheartening <laughs> for me to hear that you have to travel so far, work so hard, you know, with very questionable returns that, you know, I don't know if I was willing to put myself through that, um, budding family through that. Um, so that was kind of the day where I figured it just might not be worth it, which might not be worth it for me, which could be worth it for others, but it just, I didn't really see it fitting into my life. Let me ask you this, Ezra. Mm -hmm. give, me, give us an example of a task you do at work on a daily or weekly basis. Just give us a sampling. Sure. Um, well, at least um, at Amazon, for instance, um, one of the things that I might do is, you know, try to look at the current utterances, current sentences that Alexa might be able to understand at, at, at this point and try to find what, what kind of utterances are we not giving our customers? Um, what um, utterances that the data might suggest might be necessary do we not have? And I'm going through a lot of linguistic data to do that. And, you know, I'm in charge basically from start to finish on an entire design of, I have an idea of something that Alexa should be able to understand. I'm going to execute it from testing it with um, the current machinery that Alexa has all the way to the release um, into Alexa's software. Um, so that's, you know, something I'm doing every day. I'm going through a bunch of <laughs> linguistic data and, you know, seeing what utterances could make us better. All right, so I'm gonna get super uh, detailed here. What is the format of that data? Is it a CSV file? Is it a special tooling? 
So this is where I begin to dance with my NDA. <laughs> oh, fair <laughs> enough. Fair yeah. enough. Sure. Uh, so for those who might not know, there's a, a non-disclosure agreement at many tech firms, both large and small. Um, and I think the one thing they might tell you during training is to be careful there. But um, I would say that the format that I'm looking at it in is definitely something approachable if you've had linguistic training at a bachelor's degree level, master's degree level and onwards. That's for sure. Excellent. OK. Yeah. Um, do you miss academics? It's a very fair question. And to me, it's a very easy answer. I don't. Um, and that's not to cast aspersions onto anyone who might be listening, who you know does miss academia, who really enjoys it. I think that's wonderful that you do. And it's obviously a really, really noble thing to be in academia. I really believe that in my heart. Um, I would say that you know, the, the thing that I really don't miss is the incentive structures in academia. You know, there's no limiting factor. You should always be publishing more. Um, a lot of your major career approvals have to be, you know, of your peers and not the customer. So, you know, getting tenure has a lot to do with um, impressing the, the academy, i.e. other academics, versus, you know, trying to make the customer experience best. And, you know, every, every evaluation scheme is fraught, but I'd much rather work on impressing um, customers than, you know, other academics, just a personal predilection. Great. Uh, can you think of a skill you've learned since you've entered industry? Oh boy. Um, yes. I anyone, think, pick, pick anyone. Yeah. You know, I, um, I think for, even though I'm certainly not a project manager, I would say a lot of those type of skills of, you know, scheduling meetings, um, making sure that everyone's on task, timekeeping, things like that, you know, anything that involves keeping people up to date with information of an evolving project. That's not something that I think grad school really prepares you for, particularly in linguistics where research teams tend to be small. Um, I can, if um, I would say that my, my first boss out of grad school could definitely tell you that, you know, this whole timekeeping thing took me several months to figure out. And it's a little silly thing like that, but it's really something that is kind of alien when you're a grad student, because a grad student, you know, your time isn't, uh, isn't viewed the same way. There's not really working hours. You're just working. That's a great point. Uh, side uh, note, I, uh, several years ago, we hired a, uh, uh, a guy straight out of the army. He went into uh, the army as a high school student. He was about 25, 26. He left. He had never had a real job, a real job. He had only been in the army. We hired him into IBM and he shows up the first day and kind of looks around and goes, uh, when do I start? He, he was so used to that rigid army structure of somebody telling him exactly what to do every second, every minute. But in industry, you know, you show up at 9 a.m., show up at 9.05 a.m., no one's, no one's keeping track of exactly where you are at any moment, but you have a job to do and you have a task to complete. Um, how did you find uh, the Amazon job? Sure. Um, basically, I was given some really, really good advice um, very very early on in my career, i.e. a year and a half ago, um, which is basically, you no. Know, even if you have a wonderful job and you're working in that, and you're in the middle of that, you don't have necessarily have immediate plans to uh, be leaving, still look for a job. Never stop looking, um, which was something very odd to me because I got an amazing job out of, out of grad school and I was like, why, why should I keep doing this? Um, but really, you know, those opportunities will show up when you're not necessarily ready for them and it doesn't necessarily make sense but you should still know about those opportunities. Um, so, you know, I was looking at different job boards constantly throughout my first job. And as it happens, you know, on amazon.jobs, which is, you know, the Amazon uh, job engine, the most up-to-date place for Amazon jobs, something came up in, uh, in the city that I knew I'd be moving to relatively soon. And I jumped on it. You know, it's, it was just a, a matter of being very pesky at looking at all the resources that you have in front of you. So that brings up a good point is uh, relocation. For your first job, you, you were already in DC and you stayed in DC, correct? Correct. Uh, so, but it sounds like you will be relocating soon? That's right. Um, I'm actually going to be going back to where I grew up in Boston. Um, I'm actually in DC right now speaking to you from Foggy Bottom. Um, but uh, Amazon is letting me um, work from the DC area um, until early next year. Great. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's a, of course, it's the COVID thing, um, but 
it's, you know, the relocation, relocation thing is really, really tough. And I don't think that's necessarily something that's unique to linguistics. And I would say that one of the challenges that I certainly had coming out of grad school is that while DC is a pretty good market for linguistics jobs, it's certainly not the best one, particularly for linguistics and tech. It's, it's no Seattle, it's no Boston, it's not even in New York. Um, and that can be really tough. And that was honestly a challenge that I had when looking through all these different, you know, LinkedIn, doc, LinkedIn uh, listings, and they're just not your city. And that can be really tough. Right, right. Uh, so since you've recently been in the job search, you have a good insight into this better than, say, me or some of the other folks who've been at the same job for a while. Um, you know, how, I don't want to say easy, but like, how did you go searching for linguist jobs? Oh, uh, strictly yeah. keyword searching or, or what were your, what were your yeah. tips? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's, it's really terrible because we're a very misunderstood people, us linguists. Um, to give you an example, when I searched linguist in LinkedIn, um, you know, as grad school is ending, you get translator jobs. Nothing wrong with being a translator. That's not what we think linguists are. Um, so what it really was, um, was, you know, link, like keyword searches kind of drew me, got me a little bit crazy. Um, but ultimately what ended up being great was reaching out to other linguists. And I know it's something that I think people have must have heard um, in the past few weeks, but it's, it sounds tired, but it really is true. And I was very lucky to be in a department um, that had um, Alex Johnston, um, who was a really incredible, incredible, incredible resource um, for linguistics in academia. I was really lucky to have a hiring, hiring manager slash first boss, um, Emily Pace as well, who was a linguist herself and really understood linguists. Um, I think it's really about being in depth in the linguist community. And I think that actually helps most directly. Great. All right. Uh, so I want to make sure we, we have plenty of time for everybody. So what I'm going to do is I ask you one last question. And I stole this question from one of my favorite podcasts. So it's not mine. This is I feel petty. I want you to think about something you feel petty about. And for example, I, I work at IBM. And I am completely petty about the career framework that kind of we have to do so many kind of onerous, silly things to progress in our career. We have to fill out all this paperwork. We have to do these fake classes. They're horrible. I'm very petty about the career framework at IBM. Can you think of something you feel petty about in your career? Oh, for sure. And I'm glad you tapped into my petty side. This is great. <laughs> um, I am definitely most petty about job skill lists um, on, on job sites because I took it as a bare minimum. Here's all the lists you have. Really, it's like a, a Christmas wish list, more, more, more likely. Um, I remember seeing some of them aren't even nonsensical. And I remember seeing that some job wanted something like 10 or 12 years of Python 3 experience. I don't even know if Python 3 came out then. Like a, a lot, of, it's like, yeah, a lot of things that are just really like not sensical. They're not gonna, I don't know what candidate would fill all this. So really just like, I think taking the list of uh, qualifications with a little bit of a grain of salt, I think was something that I really wish I knew at the beginning. I was very happy about that. Great, great. Uh, actually, I think maybe uh, I will ask you one last question because you brought up something that, I, uh, that I'm going to ask everybody, and that is, sure. what is the role of coding in your day-to-day -day job? You mentioned yeah. Python. Do you know Python? Do you work with that? I, it's a great question. I know Python the way a linguist would know Python. I don't know Python the way a um, NLP person would know Python. And there's definitely, I think definitely a distinction there. I've had about, I would say, three courses in Python um, academically and have done it in practice in my last job and a little bit in this job. Um, I would say that even in roles where you don't do coding directly, the thought processes that coding gives you is tremendously invaluable in whatever NLP related job you're doing, even if you're not directly coding. So like for those who are listening who are early enough in their career, um, well actually you're, it's never too late to, to teach yourself anything, but um, I would say for those particularly who are still in grad school, even taking one or two coding courses, even if it's not for the content, it's for the, it's for the style of thinking. So I would say. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and we will still be able to come back uh, to Ezra uh, later on, but I am going to move on now. Uh, I see there are some questions coming up. These are some general questions in the chat. Uh, let's circle back to those at the end, but there's some really important questions there. Um, now I want to move on to uh, Esme, Esme Menendez. Did I pronounce that correctly? No. Nope. I'm on these. <laughs> on these. 
Beautiful. I don't have okay. There. Okay, but that's okay. Uh, people call me so oftentimes merchandise. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, so uh, I'm Esme Manandis. I was born and raised in Brussels, Belgium, and I came to the States to uh, study uh, linguistics. I graduated from uh, the University of Arizona, and uh, my thesis advisor was uh, Dr. Susan Steele. I believe she's in the audience today. And uh, when I finished, uh, so uh, my interest uh, in uh, graduate school was uh, formal uh, syntax and Montague semantics and any type of, uh, of formal grammars. And early on, I knew that I also wanted to go into coding. So I took uh, already courses in computer sciences. So I feel a little of a cheater here, uh, but uh, I did major in uh, linguistic with a minor in computer science. When I finished uh, my PhD, I actually got three uh, jobs in uh, academia. Uh, two uh, in the state, one's in Flagstaff at the university there, one in San Jose, and then one at home back in Belgium. And I'm a French speaker from Belgium. So jobs in, at universities are very few and rare. And uh, after, by Christmas, I knew that I didn't know, I didn't want to teach about language and linguistics. I actually wanted to do uh, code development and create uh, products that were based on natural language. And so I was in touch with Susan Steele uh, while I was back there, and she uh, kept sending me a job notification that she came across. So I uh, ended up finding a job in the area that I wanted uh, was to develop uh, work on natural language technologies. So my main tenure professionally has been at IBM at TJ Watson. Uh, at the research center. My last manager was David Ferrucci uh, when he was still big on the, the so-called Jeopardy. But when he left, uh, we still went working on the, uh, we work on the um, health industry. But another manager of mine was uh, Dr. Michael McWhort, who uh, was a mathematician actually, but he developed all this uh, language technology and parsing technology that was used, uh, at, which is and was at the core of the Watson uh, project, the Jeopardy. And while I was there, uh, living the life of, since you are IBM, you know, of the IBMer, you know, people do a whole career there. Uh, somebody contacted me through LinkedIn, uh, my current manager at Intuit. And um, I usually get a lot of, uh, inquiries through LinkedIn, mostly people from various outfits wanted to know if they want, uh, I'm interested in uh, a new job. But this one, rather than being long and tedious, was funny and it piqued my curiosity. And I agreed to, uh, to a job, uh, to a first contact by phone. And uh, uh, I thought the problem that they wanted to solve was really fascinating. And uh, I went for the job interview, the formal interview with homework, because in this space of natural language technology, typically you receive a natural language problem for which you have to code a solution that you deliver to the team that's going to do the hiring or, and the interview. And then you, you, flow, you go to the interview and you discuss why you implemented it this way. Uh, what are the possible uh, outcomes and uh, uh, the, pit, uh, the pitfalls and all of that. No, I have to confess it took me three months to accept the offer. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and so I've been with Intuit uh, for four years and a half. And uh, I work on uh, my data is always unstructured and annotated row text and pattern series. Fantastic. Uh, so I am very familiar with the slot grammar, as, as a matter of fact. Uh, yeah, sure. The grammar that Michael McCord. Yes. Uh, not for the rest of the crowd, but uh, we actually are trying to get that open sourced. Uh, there's still a group of IBMers who are trying to get that released. Uh, it would make so much sense if it were. I would then work on Intuit to use it. Oh, fantastic. Other than use Spacey and other type of uh, prices out there. Yeah. So 
So that leads to the question related to the Python question, which is what kind of tools do you normally use, NLP tools in, in this new Intuit work? Okay, all day long, I, uh, probably half of my time is actual hands-on development coding directly in uh, Python. Okay, then uh, this company has a very special, uh, um, the development mentality, because there is one is very different from the one at uh, IBM. At IBM, my whole career there, I was developing tools uh, with IBM technology for IBM usage. Here, they like to accelerate things. And so we use a lot of uh, open source uh, third parties of code uh, libraries. And so um, I, uh, I use what's out there. I poke around, go behind the scene, and then I tailor and see uh, what it would take to uh, uh, to adapt it to my end goals. So uh, if it's open source and we can uh, uh, modify directly the code, then I'll just do it. Uh, and uh, that's it. Yeah. Uh, so. You've done a lot of research stuff in, in your career. So this may, I think the answer may be obvious, but I'll ask it anyways. How important is the PhD to what you do? Or could you do this job with say just a master's? Well, I don't think so. For one thing, the two things, I think that by the time you go to the PhD, you really, so you have an ID, that's the purpose of your PhD. You want to prove it, right? And so you not only write about it, but you investigate it. And you develop uh, a, the proof of concept and you test it. And I think these are the type of analytical skills that uh, are often required when you work on a project that is a little more high level, where you actually have to take the uh, initiative to solve a problem and, uh, rather than be just an executioner. And I think the PhD uh, develops all these analytical skills in the space of natural language. So you learn to uh, uh, to analyze uh, the data, to interpret it, to create this, uh, uh, various tools to have even more insight on massive data. Uh, you learn to validate that the evidence, and uh, you learn all of that while you do your PhD. I was very fortunate to take a lot of uh, individual studies uh, with the faculty members and especially my thesis advisor. And uh, she was a tough cookie. She was always asking me, why, why? You know, like a shot, why, why? And so that forced me to always think about why am I saying this? What is the proof? What is the counter proof? And I think this is very useful. I don't think that at the master level, you. Uh, the programs demands that you push the envelope this way. You're still learning a lot of uh, basic skills. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's potentially a touchy question uh, for, for political reasons. Which or have you worked on any non-English NLP problems? Uh, yes, uh, but that was at IBM. So initially when I got uh, the job at IBM, uh, it was to take uh, the uh, natural language technology that Michael McCord had uh, developed uh, for English. And uh, I was asked to take that technology and uh, do it for the Romance languages. And the Romance, Romance languages at the time for IBM were defined as French, Spanish, uh, Brazilian, Portuguese, and Italian. But so I devised a way of doing more or less like a universal grammar and use switches or flags. Uh, so write a common grammar and the code behind that covered those four Romance languages. And then since you knew at the outset the language you were parsing, then if the, the flag would tell you, well, given this context, this pattern, then you need to apply now what applies to the, lang the source language. Yeah. So. Right. And so uh, peripheral to that, and this is kind of where I'm going with this question is, um, how did you find non-English NLP resources? And what I mean is, were they demonstrably worse than the NLP resources for English? Were they harder to use? Were they harder, et cetera? 
Yeah, as I said, actually, because it was within the IBM frame, everything is IBM. So I, at the time, I didn't look outside the IBM entity. And so all the, whatever texts were available, they were already in-house, everything was in-house. So there were no looking outside uh, IBM, which is something I wouldn't do nowadays because after four years of Intuit, before I implement anything or looking to implement something, I go see what's out there. Right. Uh, for context for the, for the folks on the Zoom, um, generally speaking, the NLP world revolves around languages from rich countries. So English has tons of NLP resources. Mm -hmm. Western European uh, languages spoken in Western European countries have reasonably good NLP resources. Mm -hmm. You go find that, that region, phew, the availability and workability of a lot of NLP simply drops off. It just yeah. a, yes, correct. No resource languages, yeah. Um, so let's go way back to uh, when you left academia, how did you find your first job? I'm not sure you mentioned that. No, I mentioned it through, I, I was always in touch with my thesis advisor and she was sending me, whenever she came across job offers, I mean, job listings, she would just communicate them to me. And uh, that's how it happened. So for me, uh, again, uh, um, it is networking, but it's a type of passive networking. It's word of mouth if you want to uh, in that. And I think it works. If people know you, you spread the word uh, and you say, oh, I know such and such person. So I, I didn't have to look for one or, you know, enter anything in LinkedIn for that matter. They just contacted me. I was more fortunate. So how have you found LinkedIn in general? How long, how long have you been on LinkedIn? Oh, for a long time, uh, but uh, I think I, I follow some people in the space of NLP. Uh, typically, the people are more controversial because uh, you really, um, in the end, I do NLP, uh, right? Uh, but I find that um, people who do, the, the real practitioners of NLP often have been trained in computer science and they are, uh, some spaces like natural language understanding, but I think they they lack the understanding of the granularity of uh, semantics that are needed to put into uh, natural language uh, technology. And uh, so there are some people uh, who are arguing that there's some limits to how much we can do with NLP. And I, I like it very controversial and I typically follow them on LinkedIn because they post things where uh, they are open about their beliefs that there are limits to uh, data-driven natural language approaches. Great. I think we have, there's a shift actually going on right now. I think we're gonna go away from this blind faith in massive data to do uh, natural language analysis. Interesting. Okay, great. Well, well he's giving me the thumbs up. Thank you, Ezra. Yeah, uh, traditionally, data scientists have loved big data, right? That's that's they always say, "Go well, more data at the problem, and that solves it." But of course, we know that that's actually not true. Yeah. Can you think of some advice you've gotten in your career, particularly mid-career, once you were already in it, that you thought was really, really useful? Okay. I'm gonna say this as a woman here, okay? And I don't know if it's appropriate, but I have to say it. My whole career, I have been the up token in the team. It's oftentimes the only woman there. And, uh, and what my career advice is that, let's say for the other female uh, linguists, right? Stand your ground, don't be intimidated. If you have something to offer, just, um, just discuss it in a cool scientific way and never think that uh, you can't do the job, that's all. Fantastic. And let me ask you, have you, uh, have you been on hiring committees in your time in industry? 
Well, I mean, uh, internally, usually, not outside. Uh, uh, but within the companies I've held, uh, I do what is called uh, a for a, I assess job candidates, I assess uh, within the company people who want to go up for promotion. And typically, uh, they, uh, they never in the field of natural language, it's pure engineering work. But I have to develop uh, that side to be successful. And, uh, you know, if you are able uh, to do a PhD in linguistics and uh, develop all these analytical skills, you know, you can learn anything, I think. If you have the passion and the willingness to learn it, really, go ahead and do it. And so what I'm getting at is, so when you look at a resume, how do you see that passion? Like, what, what's the kind of things that jump out at you in a good resume? Um... Well, this is the question about the hard and the soft skills, right? Uh, I mean, it's a little abstract. Uh, I would see how the linguist presented uh, himself, herself in terms of their hard skills, right? Well, the, I think it's important to em emphasize the analytical skills because I think Ezra mentioned that it still irritates me when people ask me, how many languages do you speak? I just can't stand it because people still assume that linguistics is all about speaking languages. That has nothing to do with well-known and lots in the audience only speak English, right? And they still lingu uh, the professional linguists. So the important thing is, is precisely uh, um, make clear all these analytical skills that are developed doing uh, linguistic as a scientific systematic approach of language, right? Data and languages and uh, make that prominent in the, uh, in the resumes because these analytical skills are skills that you can use in software engineering, in design, in taxonomy development, in content architecture. And I think that a, a linguists that are well prepared uh, um, can succeed in something that may be uh, outside of linguistics, but it's possible. So that's what I would say. Oh yeah, and then the soft skill had to be assessed. I would also see what type of soft skill could uh, indicate uh, the passion and the uh, uh, disponibility to learn more, right? Yeah. Uh, and in general, over your career, do you attend things like uh, meetups or conferences? Do you, do you still stay connected to things like that? Yeah, I try to give uh, one paper or two papers a year. Uh, but they typically, nowadays, they were in NLP and engineering, but they always have to do with natural language. Uh, so can you name a couple of conferences that you generally like to target? Uh, so one, uh, uh, I did the one, the latest one was at the, the Florida um, Artificial Intelligence, Intelligence Society. Uh, the paper was published on one of the things we did at Intuit. Uh, there was another one uh, hosted also by the uh, ACL in Europe, EACL. Uh, it was about uh, um, financial narrative. So I, I tailored the paper to the type of work I do and I, I, I leverage what I've learned by doing and then I abstract the way and share. But in, in practice, typically, the companies are more interested in patterns. They would rather have pattern submissions than paper published. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Yeah, so I do at least one pattern a year. Right, right. Uh, let's also talk for a moment. Oh, and an important thing, sorry. Uh, an important thing is that don't be a loner. My experience to be best, I always work in team and I do everything. The papers is collaborative, the patterns are collaborative. And uh, never present yourself as the one that always knows best and goes, your heart, you ride your horse alone. Uh, yeah, team is better. Fantastic, yeah, totally agree. Um, so I wanna ask real quick about work-life balance. Um, 
Do you feel you've been pressured to work, and I mean just in general, to work more than 40, 50 hours a week? I haven't been pressured to do it. I'm a workaholic. I was already a workaholic when I was in grad school, which means that when there was social event in the department, I was one of the ones who never showed up. Uh, but this is a preference, it's my personality, but I haven't been pressured. I, I've just learned that I have a family and you know, but I've learned to uh, just uh, work off time when things are quiet or whatever around the house. Uh, but the pressure not, not by the companies, no. Good, that's... Very good, okay. So along those lines, just quickly, is there something non-linguistic and non-professional that you uh, do in your personal life? Are you a knitter? Are you a horse rider? Uh, I'm an avid, avid walker. Beautiful, fantastic. I walk uh, late at night when it's quiet with a dog, by the way, a big dog, a, 16, a 60 pounder. So I can feel protected. <laughs> okay, I, I am gonna save some time at the end for the questions that are in the chat, but uh, let's go ahead and move, to move on. Uh, we're gonna move on to Rich Campbell. Rich, you've had quite a career. I was looking at your uh, LinkedIn page. So why don't you give us the quick uh, two minute summary of uh, where you started and where you are now? All right, I, um, I got a PhD in linguistics from UCLA and um, specializing in syntax. And uh, I originally went into an academic career and I spent 10 years in academic positions, um, two one-year positions, and then I went uh, and got a position at uh, a, a small state university in Michigan and got tenure there and was there for eight years total. Um, about that time, I. I had some dissatisfaction with um, various aspects of my career and felt like I wanted to move back to the West Coast, which is where I'm from. And an opportunity fell in my lap. I knew someone who worked at Microsoft Research, a guy I went to graduate school with, and he arranged for me to come out for an interview. And uh, I really didn't think much of it. I thought this is you know, quite a long shot, but they ended up offering me the job and found it kind of hard to refuse. Um, so we, my wife and family and I moved out here to Seattle, uh, at about that time. Uh, I worked at Microsoft research for five years. Then I left and went to, uh, work for another company called Catafora, um, for nine years, a very different line of work. And then, uh, after that, uh, Catafora started to wind down. I, I found another job, uh, working for a company called interactive intelligence which um, the title of this just encouraged all of my family members who didn't understand what I was doing to think that I was actually a spy. Um, but of course it has nothing to do with that. Uh, interactive intelligence was swallowed up by Genesis. So I've, I've been at that job and you know, under one name or another for about seven years, actually almost eight years now. Um, so it, it has changed a lot, I, I guess uh, that my experience in companies, you know, working in industry is small company, big company, medium-sized company. So I guess I've done it all in that sense. Um, and uh, I work in a small group of linguists where, you know, we've sort of carved out a niche for, for what we uh, intend to do. Fantastic. So it's great that you've had a variety of experiences. How has being a linguist been perceived or received by the companies you've worked at? And you had to sort of fight to be recognized? Actually, no. Um, I was lucky that in all of these places, I was hired specifically as a linguist and I uh, was expected to do linguistic work, at least at the beginning. Um, so Microsoft Research, there was an NLP team in which we were developing various applications uh, in a variety of languages. And uh, I, I think at the time it was the, um, the grammar checker was the main product when I joined that that uh, was being worked on. Um, when I went to Catafora, they were looking specifically for linguists. There was a team of linguists uh, under uh, Dick Early was the chief linguist. And uh, we, it, it's interesting in that case, we were working directly with customers. 
Um, so it was a very different kind of work. And we, uh, all of us being having PhDs in linguistics or, or advanced degrees in linguistics was kind of a selling point for the customers. So the company actually charged for our time you know, we had an hourly rate and we had to bill by the hour um, and they could charge higher for a PhD in linguistics. So it was all, it was all part of a sales job. I mean, there was linguistics, linguistics to do also, but it was also part of a sales job. And when I uh, started out at Interactive Intelligence, we were doing um, text-to-speech and automatic speech recognition systems for different languages. They were specifically looking for linguists to, um, compile the resources, work out phonology problems, that sort of thing. Um, and it, that job has evolved quite a bit over the years, especially since the merger. But uh, in every case, uh, I was hired specifically as a linguist. So I didn't really have that fight, at least not, to, I didn't have to do it individually. And did you, did you ever write code or was that not really ever a part of your career? So I never wrote code that's used in a product, but I use Python quite a bit. Um, to write, to create tools that I or my teammates will use uh, for the various kind of analyses that we want to do. Uh, it uh, doesn't go into a product. It's just for use among uh, myself and our, and my teammates. Um, example of something you've created? Um, I, you know, most of them are, are the sort of thing where I create it and, and, you know, I'll use it for a few days until we go on to the next project. But um, for example, you know, we, we're working on uh, chat bots, for example, and voice bots and like everybody, I guess. And, um, you know, we get, uh, we have uh, an engine that gives us results in a JSON format um, that uh, we need to analyze those results. So oftentimes I'll write scripts to take in those results, perform some kind of analysis on them, um, sort them in some way that, so that we can look at them uh, and do our sort of qualitative analysis on it uh, more fully. That's a very common kind of script that I would write. Fantastic. And you would write that in Python? Python, I, yes. Uh, so I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, anticipate a question that you're going to ask me about what is a great piece of advice. I, um, years ago when I joined Catafora, uh, Dick Hurley said, learn Python. And I did. And it's been a great help. Have, do, have, do you work with uh, other languages or people who write in other languages? Well, I definitely, I will work with a lot of engineers who also write in Python or they might write in other languages if they see fit. I don't generally have to deal much with those other languages um, in terms of looking at their code. Uh, Python is even, even among the, um, the machine learning engineers um, uh, in our in our uh, company, in our division, uh, it's Python is still the, the tool that's most favored, I think. Yeah, I think that's generally true across NLP, yeah. my experience. Uh, now, have you worked with any other uh, non-English natural languages? I have, and uh, but again, mostly the rich ones. Um, so, you know, we are, uh, the things we work on are driven by what the company sees as its needs. And uh, these, tend to be um, English, Western European languages, maybe Japanese and Mandarin. Uh, it's really uh, been limited to that. But, you know, I have worked a lot on those, um, both at the, my current job and the previous job, and that we're still doing a lot of that work, trying to expand our, our um, abilities into other languages, languages that the company sees as, as uh, in its, you know, sort of near-term future. Um, so we're doing that a lot actually. Fantastic. Great. Um, and do you, like, like in your current role, since you've been, you're in a senior role, so do you get input into the kinds of uh, products or services the uh, company is seeking to produce or move into? Yes, but um, I get some input. I can't swear that it's all, you know, paid close attention to. But yes, we do get consulted on, um, you know, somebody is developing a new idea for, uh, you know, things we want bots to do in the next, the next generation of bots, uh, for example, we might get consulted on that. And so we have a, a project that might last several months where we um, go back and forth with them about, uh, you know, how feasible we think this is, 
you know, whether it's really well conceived, that sort of thing. Um, in terms of, you know, directly proposing what kind of products or, you know, we should do this or that, I'm not that senior. Um, in general, as you progress through your career, do you feel like you've uh, had the opportunities that other people in the company that are maybe engineers, et cetera, have had in, in terms of career advancement? So has being a linguist hurt you, helped you, or been irrelevant? I think on the whole, I think it's helped me in that I think that uh, because uh, myself and our and my uh, the team that I work with are linguists, we sort of have this and we're, you know, a group and we refer to ourselves as the linguists and other groups that are within the AI division refer to us as the linguist team, right? So we've sort of carved out this identity as being the experts in these certain areas. And I think that has helped us, right? That we have, um, uh, we've been able to, like I said, carve out this, er this area of expertise and people come to us with problems and propose new problems that they think we might uh, deal with. And I think it's helped that we are kind of different, right? I, I think that if there's one thing that I've kind of noticed in uh, industry for linguists is that linguists are kind of treated as special in both a good way and bad way, you know, and, and that we can benefit from that. And one of the ways we're special is that we know about things that they wish they knew about. And the other way we're special is that we don't know about things that they wish we did know about. So we get special treatment that way too. Fantastic. Yeah. So I asked this question of Esme, I'm gonna ask it of you. Uh, do you sit on hiring committees? And if yes, what do you look for in new applicants? Um, not committees per se, but I do sometimes review resumes if, if it's something within our group or in a, a closely related group. Um, and I think what I'm looking for, again, of course, it's going to vary a little bit depending on specifically what the company is looking for in this position, what's been approved. But I think what I'm looking for is someone who um, has experience doing linguistics and I'm sort of repeating what Esme said here, somebody who has shows that they've you know, engage with, with linguistics a little bit or a medium amount, uh, as opposed to somebody who's just a, a, a this is gonna sound like I'm putting them down, it's not what I mean, but somebody who's a computer scientist, you know, an uh, NLP person who has worked on language related problems, that doesn't show me that they're necessarily engaged in linguistics, right? And, and so I think for our group, we're, we sort of have this identity as bringing this different kind of qualitative research to the table and uh and so i'm looking for that great fantastic uh and, and that's it's good that you agree with us it means there's a consensus <laughs> um so i'm gonna throw uh this last one out at you uh what do you feel petty about in in industry i feel petty about a lot of things oh, okay. um, <laughs> um i think uh when you mentioned that uh, before to ezra i think what crossed my mind uh is something that i feel petty about is uh, the way that um, something that came up recently, I won't give any specifics, but the way that uh, um, higher executives in the company come up with these ideas um, for th various things that they want to do without really thinking about how it's going to work and who, you know, what it's going to take to do that. And, um, you know, this is just my personal attitude. And I, you know, this is a blanket statement that probably isn't true. But I sometimes look, think, feel like executives are looking for something to justify their job. <laughs> I, I was going to say, I hope it's not being recorded, but I'm sure it is. So uh, that's that's my pettiness. That's my main pettiness lately. Fair enough. Fair enough. Good. Good. Uh, Esme, I forgot to ask you that question. Do you have something in industry that you feel petty about that you'd like to share? If not, that's okay. No. Probably a lot, but having been born in Europe and raised in in, uh, in Europe, if I feel petty about something, I usually immediately think, immediately think, oh well, if I were in Europe, I would have a union rep, and that's where I would go. So I usually uh, don't express anything about that. Sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, I'm going to get to some of the questions in the chat now. Thank you, panelists, for your one-on-ones. Uh, these questions I'm going to ask for the panelists as a whole, 
Uh, and also there are uh, folks sitting in who have quite good experience in industry as well. You're welcome to, to pitch in as well. Um, I'll basically open this up to all the experts on the call. Um, one of the questions is about uh, resources. So one of the things that I'll just speak for myself, I entered industry in the mid 2000s. And for me, I would have been a much better entry level candidate if I had started now, if only because the resources for learning about NLP are so much better now than they were 10 or 15 years ago. Tutorials, Kegel competitions, just books, even just the packages themselves, something like Spacey, that just didn't exist 15 years ago. Uh, you had to really, really learn, like learning Python 15 years ago was way harder than learning now. So what I want to go, uh, and Ezra, I'm going to start with you since you're uh, the earliest career uh, linguist, what kind of uh, resources do you reach out to when you need to teach yourself something, et cetera? Sure. Um, I think for general networking things, um, the special interest group, you know, which we're, I think, all aware of here, Linguistics Beyond Academia was really incredible. I think particularly reaching out to the people that were the head of it. Um, I think it's it's been shown in my experience, I think, that none of those linguists are above talking to a new career person. And it's really been a beautiful thing. I remember early on when I was really wondering what I was going to be doing with my life after a linguistics degree, reaching out to Laurel Sutton, who has a bunch of experience in the, ling in the professional linguistics world, very willing to talk to me. And I think that's kind of been the feeling um, that I've had in, in reaching out to people. So I think definitely that special interest group was a really, really big thing for me. Um, and I would say beyond that, I think LinkedIn, I think with caution has been really, really helpful to me, particularly because, you know, it allows you to see the career trajectory of different linguists that maybe are five or six years ahead of you. And I found that to be incredibly helpful. It's incredibly helpful internally, even within Amazon, where you can see what kind of roles people are going to and what kind of companies people are transferring to and what people's, you know, jobs were coming out of uh, grad school. I think those two resources, I think, were incredibly helpful. And I'm sure there's more, but that's definitely what worked for me. Great. Esme, you work with a lot of, uh, it sounds like you do a lot of just uh, core coding. Um, do you find yourself reaching out to uh, online resources, et cetera, to teach yourself how something works, like say Spacey, or et cetera, or do you try to figure it out yourself? What's your method? That's a mix of, of both, but of course, uh, since I have to, uh, basically uh, a lot of, I have to find solution on the go quickly when I'm programming something. So I use a Stack Overflow a lot yep. to check a few things, yeah. And so you learn to do it and you learn to develop intuitions about what to trust, you know, quickly skim through it. But that's one of my main uh, resource for on the spot clarifying coding something. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I've had to learn uh, is to be very self-sufficient uh, in this uh, space. Uh, all the toolings that I have to use, the platforms, and you just do it. But I have to say, this is an anecdote, but it make, uh, it's interesting. I have a summer intern. She's uh, a uh, rising junior. Uh, from Caltech in computer science, and she's working on a problem uh, with me, uh, for me and with me on a CUI, conversational user interface, and one of the problems is intent classification, right, for customer care, and uh, she had absolutely no background in NLP, nothing, yet it's an NLP related pr uh, problem, a very important one uh, for Intuit. And uh, one of the resources, she took the initiative, she signed up on Coursera and some other online course, and she completed some NLP courses over the weekends early on. And these are resources that I would uh, recommend to people early in their career as major in linguistics to look at what's available out there. And they were very well done and they're given by specialists. Uh, I've checked a few of them to see, uh, I know. Fantastic. Rich, do you have any uh, other resources you reach out to when you need to teach yourself something? Well, I just want to, you know, second the, uh, the idea about Stack Overflow, which I use practically every day. And, um, and also Coursera is a great resource or if you can find a course of something you're interested in. Other than that, I think 
that you can find a lot of things online. I mean, everything's online now, right? So if you if it's a problem about some specific, you know, specific Python specific problem, you could just look into the Python documentation, which is all online uh, for you know looking up a particular module and figure out how to do it. I use that a lot. Um, it's just really, I think, just being able to use the uh, search engine and finding that stuff and knowing what you look for, what to look for is very helpful. And then coworkers, you know, I have coworkers that have a different background and, and, you know, it's their job to know a lot of stuff that I don't know. So I, I don't hesitate to ask them. Sure. Actually, and just to jump, jump in and one more resource that you guys are causing me to think of um, is O'Reilly books. Um, yeah. And basically they've been really incredible for those that don't know. It's a publisher who, publishes different educational books um, about tech and they tend to do it really, really quickly. Bare bones illustrations kind of stuff. I'm reading one right now about um, VUIs, voice user interfaces, and they can be really, really cutting edge. You know, they don't wait for publication like a lot of uh, other more corporate textbooks do. And that's been tremendously helpful early in the career. And I think many O'Reilly books are published both on a physical for cost basis and given out as a free PDF. That's right. Absolutely. It doesn't cost that much. Yeah. Um, I, th this is not so much a question, but a lot of us are working on chatbots now. Uh, it's just it's just a big thing. And I, I just wanted to point out to everyone, and, and I, I would like to kind of start a discussion here with, with the professionals, is I just saw a blog post, and I, I can try to find it and put it in the chat, about a um, chatbot designer who had discovered... Gricean maxims. And uh, for those who don't know, Grice's maxims are these conversational principles about how people cooperate in a conversation, make things relevant, make them uh, short, et cetera. And uh, she wrote that, written up this really beautiful uh, blog post about how she was using Gricean maxims to make her chatbot better. And the conversation starter is, is what a brilliantly non-engineering expertise that is right like you that's not an engineer's expertise but it's going to make a chatbot incredibly better if you have an understanding of that um for those of you working on chatbots kind of what kind of non-engineering linguistic -y things are you bringing to those developments like understanding turns and things like that can i go go ahead i mean um one of the things that uh, I, we are working, me and my uh, intern, is the three classifiers that we have created and train after some other. We want to uh, refine the distinction. It's a, a notion that people training in NLP in computer science don't, are not familiar with. The difference between form and function is that you can express a speech act, what they call a dialogue, in many ways. Uh, uh, and so, so for instance, here, let me give you an example. In the customer care, of, uh, there's this uh, request for a, a life help, and it is, give me a life person now, you, and on and on and on. And the intent is feedback hate, right? But there's a, it's not different from saying, give me life help is that the, 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 the speech act is still the same and request for something. It just happens to be a, in the a bad, abusive language, right? So this is one of the things that needs to be improved in all of the CUI, this uh, linguistic notion of the distinction between form and function. And a lot of the um, strictly ML-based approaches to classification, uh, intent classification is just, uh, skims the surface of the language without having really a deep understanding of this distinction. So because you can add the same request said in many, many, many ways with lots of F, 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 F and other things, that's it. That's brilliant, yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so there's lots of, uh, I, think, I think with chatbots, I think we're going to see an, uh, an explosion in the need for pure linguistics non-engineering, pure linguistics, because designing chatbots, really ha you have to have an understanding of conversation and human language. Um, so 
Uh, let me point out, everyone, if you're not following the chat, uh, people are putting in other resources in the chat, so please do follow that. Um, the chat, I don't think, is preserved after we quit the Zoom call, so if you want those links, uh, get them now. Um, there, there is as much, um, uh, not resistance, but but there seems to be as much anxiety in the linguistics world now as there was when I entered 15 some years ago about whether or not linguists really fit in engineering companies. I think we've gotten a pretty good sense from our three panelists that that's not true, that they do. But I, I wanna go to the panelists and say, you know, um, have you encountered anything that you would call resistance to being a linguist on the teams you were on that you had to kind of overcome? Rich, you've already kind of addressed this. And I think you, you had a pretty positive experience, but let me ask uh, uh, Ezra and Esme, do, do you feel that at any point you kind of had some resistance to, you're just a linguist? Have you ever encountered that? Um, I haven't, thankfully. Um, and I think that that might have to do with the fact that the two roles that I've been at are teams, are teams of linguists. You know, right now I'm on a team of, I believe seven, um, beforehand, I was on a team of a similar number. So there is a significant amount of, I would say, insulation if that culture exists within, within the company. Um, I would say that, you know, I think part of, part of that might come from, if that culture did exist in the past, of people being maybe a little bit confused about exactly why linguists are useful. And um, I think that that is actually becoming clearer and clearer as why linguists are particularly useful. And just to give a recent example, um, one of the things that you know, Alexa is working on, of course, is you know, multi-turn conversation. Um, there's gonna be you know, a lot of give and take within Alexa. And one of the th questions that you have to ask is, are people treating Alexa like a human? And one of the things that, you know, that kind of manifests as is thanking Alexa and saying, please and thank you. Um, and that's something even as Alexa user that I find. And, you know, that um, has been discussed recently. And, you know, that's something that, you know, linguists are bringing up to engineers. Um, and, you know, that's something that if you're, you know, really on the engineering end of things, it's something that might not necessarily occur to you, but it's something that is being discussed by linguists. You know, these kind of conversations that, you know, engineers that I work with find really, really valuable are really, really coming from linguists. And I felt that, you know, our, our role has been, I think, clearly useful in my still very short career. Um, although I imagine diachronically, it's not always necessarily been that way. And, um, you know, I can't necessarily speak about, you know, you know, 10 years in the past. Yep. Rich, I forgot to ask you, do you, do you engage in any kind of uh, meetups or conferences or any kind of uh, connections to a wider community? Um, not on a regular basis. Uh, when I was at Microsoft, I did. Um, you know, I was that was a research oriented position and went to conferences frequently and and uh, um, published papers. Uh, since then, was, my work has been much more product oriented and it's really more haphazard. I go to things now and then, but not by any means on a regular basis. Fair enough. Do you do any kind of reach back or do you? Uh... Like, I know people reach out to me all the time, just random grad students saying, you know, hey, I'm interested in industry. Do you find people reaching out to you that way? Uh, occasionally, yeah. Uh, like, um, you know, past my professors or something might reach out to me and say, you know, we'd like you to come and talk about your experience, you know, kind of like this, right? Uh, your experiences in uh, industry going from academics into industry and and because students are interested in that. So that that does happen occasionally. Cool. And Esme, you've got, you said you've got this intern. Uh, have you had, a, have you worked with a lot of interns in the past? Is that generally part of your job? Yeah, every year I, I have an intern. And uh, uh, Intuit is really actually an engineering company. So all the interns that I work with are people in computer that are in computer science programs. And uh, they typically work on an engineering problem that I'm working on, uh, but that uses natural language somewhere, right? As input or whatever. Uh, I never stray far from that, that type of data, don't worry. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, every year I work with somebody and uh, they always end up uh, learning something about natural language. Oh, 
Fantastic. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ezra, let me flip it on you. Uh, did you do any internships? I didn't, oddly enough. Um, maybe I should have. Um, I had done um, sort of, you know, research. In the back when I was doing academia, I had done sort of, you know, research internships. But in terms of in the um, professional linguist world, I didn't. And um, it could be because, you know, I just wasn't aware of, you know, more pure linguistics internships that might have existed. Um, actually, I would say this is maybe somewhat related. Um, between, um, between grad school and my first job, um, I did actually um, do an internship that I think was more political in nature. It was with uh, the Joint National Committee on Languages, um, which is an umbrella group that does lobbying for language and linguistics related con um, uh, causes for Congress, which unsurprisingly their center is here in DC. Um, so I've, I worked a little bit there, but I would say that it was an ancil very ancillarily linguistics. It was mostly congressional lobbying, which is a whole other world. Um, but in terms of you know internships that are more, I would say the linguistics end of NLP, you know I wasn't really aware of it. Fair enough. Yeah. So I'll I'll ask this question very carefully, and uh, you are uh, all of course uh, allowed to answer or not answer as carefully as you want. But I want to talk about salaries, getting paid. Um, first qu question, have you ever asked for a raise? Yes. As, Ezra, you specifically asked for a raise. So you started off at something, you were at the job. How long were you at the job before you asked for a raise? I mean, I asked for a raise at the job offer. So the original offer was X and you said, I need it to go up. Correct. And Correct. why did you believe it needed to go up? I'm sorry? Why did you believe it was low? You know, I, it's a negotiation mindset thing. I would always assume that an initial job offer, they are, as they should, be trying to lowball you. And I think that's just a general job offer game that you have to play. I think that, you know, they have, they've identified skills in you if they want a job offer. They are financially incentivized to, you know, employ you for as little as possible. That's just good business sense on their part. Um, so, of course, of course, counter offer um, is my mindset there. Um, I would say that I think it's important when you've worked there for a certain amount of time. I'm not saying it's six months, I'm not saying it's a year, but it's some amount of time to reevaluate how much you make, especially if you're giving a lot to the team and you feel that you're not being requited financially by the role that you have. And, but I think that's a certainly a separate question. And where did you learn that? Like, like is this just a kind of a, a part of who you are or did somebody teach you to, to be that way? So I think sort of a negotiation mindset is a little bit about who I am, but I would say specifically to talk about that like upfront at the job offer was something that had to be taught to me. Because again, coming out of, out of academia, I had no idea what the heck to do um, regarding job offers. Um, that was actually came from a lot of my friends in college who um, oddly enough worked in things like finance, um, worked in consulting where, you know, job offers and negotiation is really everything. And that's not really a linguistics uh, stereotype, I would suppose. And I think that's somewhat based in truth. Um, um, it was really kind of friends teaching me that. I think that that is not something I've seen fellow um, linguistics friends do. And I think just general salary negotiation is something that is good for linguists and good for everybody. Great. And my same question, have you ever asked for a raise? Only once in my life, actually, when I was at IBM. <laughs> Uh, when I switched from uh, Michael McCord management to David Ferrucci, uh, since I had got my, my hands really dirty at working on all the, uh, all the coding in C, C++ from uh, English uh, uh, parsing technology to the Romance language, I thought, well, I know enough about the insights. And I did. And you know what? It was so easy. They said, oh, no problem. <laughs> I was surprised. So it was very easy. Uh, so I have no recommendation uh, because Intuit gave me such an amazing package that I didn't have to negotiate. Uh, so I don't have recommendations there. And again, being European, uh, we grow up, you know, within the uh, brackets for salaries given this, a job description. I wasn't never taught to negotiate these things. We take 
salaries given the job description for granted. But anyway. Yeah. Rich, have you ever asked for a raise? Yes, once. Um, uh, when I was uh, teaching at a university and was offered the job at Microsoft, I asked the university to reconsider my salary. And they, they came back with an offer and I said that wasn't good enough. And they came back with another offer. And that was much better, but there are other factors that they couldn't, uh, couldn't address. So I ended up not accepting anyway. Um, but um, there was something that Esme said that I, I wanted to follow up on. Um, but now I think I've lost the train of my thought a little bit. Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of it. Well, Esme, you mentioned something that I think maybe uh, I'll, I'll speak to briefly. Uh, obviously I'm at IBM, but I've been at other large corporations which have the same idea of bands. Um, and I, not every corporation does this, but it's not uncommon for uh, positions to be in a band. What a band is, is, you know, X number of dollars to X number of dollars. So if you're a band nine, that goes from 120,000 to 160,000. As long as you're in band nine, you make, you have, you can only get a raise up to that. If you want to go above that, you need to do the career move of moving up to the next band. And that involves all this career machinations and things like that. And typically involves different roles. Each band has a different role. That's certainly the way it is at IBM. That's the way it was at uh, some other companies I've been at. Uh, uh, yeah, I am. Um, yes, I'm uh, sorry. Um, I would say that there's um, a couple of good questions I think uh, posed by Alex um, in the chat that I think it was something I was, I've, was passionate about mentioning anyway. And it's particularly about doing individual research on companies that you're applying to um, and also salary ranges for entry-level positions. I certainly agree theoretically um, with that point. I think one of the challenges that um, I've had is that linguist jobs are rare enough, which makes sense. I mean, not everyone's a linguist, very rare choice um, educationally and career-wise, um, that a lot of those resources, like for instance, Glassdoor, don't have a lot of salaries on there. There just aren't a lot of data points. As a matter of fact, there are so little data points that when I um, looked at the salary range for my current position, the low side of the range was 60% lower than the high side of the range. That's a really big range. You know, this is not, this is not like looking for, you know, first law, you know, first, um, first law firm job out of college, out of law school rather, where it's a very set range. It can really be large just because there just aren't that many linguists out there. Um, and that's frankly a challenge. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, there's a good point to also be made that salaries, of course, dependent on region, where, you know, cities, et cetera. But it's also dependent on small, medium, and large companies. Large companies tend to be much more rigid in their salaries because they're dealing with so many people, they can't have that much negotiation. They, can't, they just can't allow a 60% range. Whereas a small company can often really go back and forth. It kind of depends on how ambitious and, and how comfortable you are negotiating that. Um, yeah, I don't know that I can speak to entry level uh, salaries, like what is an entry level salary? I don't know. I was never entry level because uh, I jumped I jumped from uh, being a grad student to, to being a, essentially a product manager. And that's a bit rare. So my, so my jump was a, was a bit unusual. Uh, but I'm really, I really, I, I think sometimes it's nice just to mention numbers. Not everyone is comfortable talking about their salary, but I, I'm comfortable talking about it. So uh, I just, I will say when I was a grad student in 2004, and I jumped to a consulting company in Washington, D.C., I asked for $90,000 as a starting salary. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to me. And I'm mad because I'm certain they would have given me more. I, I did the opposite of what Ezra did. <laughs> I did not negotiate. But, 90, but at the time, I was making $14,000 a year living in Buffalo. So I was pretty happy with that. Um, but that was more for a product lead role. So again, it wasn't, it wasn't entry level. Um, but I do, I do just want to kind of put some numbers out there to say, tech companies make a lot of money. You might as well make it too. <laughs> That's my position. Somebody at that company is getting rich. Sure. Um, and definitely in the, in the spirit of numbers, I will say this is particularly um, from my first job search right after grad school. Um, in terms of, you know, I was in a space where 
I wanted a job that was linguistics related and there was not many more requirements after that. So I was looking at a very wide variety of things, everything from vaguely linguistically related consulting things, um, looking at tech, looking um, politics, government, linguistics things, which is more relevant here um, around DC. I was seeing starting salaries anywhere between 35,000 and $150,000, which if that sounds crazy, it is. Um, there's a lot of different um, salary points. It depends on which kind of linguistics role you want to get into. Um, and, you know, again, I think that this is a problem that ultimately gets solved by time where you're beginning to get more data points. You have more linguist networking with each other where those numbers become a little bit clearer. We're a little bit, I feel, in a period of kind of wild west of um, employment of linguists. Just to give you an example, the job of language engineer at Amazon, which is my current title, that didn't exist five or six years ago. You know, a lot of these roles are very, very new. So this, you know, the salary numbers and salary cultural benchmarks, I think are not, they're a little bit fluid still. They're not quite ossified. Wendy is posing a couple of interesting questions in the chat. So I just want to address them real quick. Uh, how much is the salary difference between large tech companies and small companies? Um, again, there are a lot of dependent factors, but I will say that my experience has been small tech companies pay better entry level than large tech companies. Large tech companies, again, they have their bands are kind of fixed. Small tech companies tend to be a lot more open-minded and you can negotiate better. I love small tech companies as an environment. I think it's just a fantastic place to be. The problem with small tech companies is you don't know if they're going to exist 30 days from now. They go out of business easily. So you're taking a risk. Um, but I do love the environment of a small tech company. The next question is regional differences. I actually can speak to this. And of course, the panelists can speak to this as well. But I've moved across the country uh, four times in my career. So I've gotten a sense of the difference between uh, costs. I will say that, again, especially at a big company, they will literally have a number attached to the city you live in, which says, Whatever your baseline salary is, if you live in San Francisco, you get 12% more. If you move from San Francisco to Boston, you get 6% less than you were making. They literally have this written down. They know, or at least they think they know, what the cost of living difference is, and they will adjust it for you. Uh, and a lot of times you have no control. Um, again, it depends on where you are in your band. There's some other things there. Um, etc. But I will tell you right now, salary, uh, San Francisco is, as far as I can tell, the most expensive place in the country right now. Uh, and so you do get a bump, but that bump doesn't <laughs> afford. Uh, this may be a bit of an exaggeration, but honestly, I would not move to San Francisco for less than $200,000 a year. And it's just insanely expensive right now. Um, there are, because tech, I'm sorry, I don't mean to dominate, uh, but let me throw this out to uh, the team. In my opinion, because tech is fairly diffuse, you have tech centers. As you mentioned, DC is not the best, but DC is not bad. There's Austin, Dallas, uh, Boston, Seattle, San Francisco. Um, you've got some choice there, but all of those are pretty expensive cities. Even Austin, Texas is getting expensive now. Tech companies bring gentrification with them and prices go up, it's just a fact. Uh, so let me throw that out there. Um, we're, we're running low on time. I just wanna take a quick, uh, oh, someone's, so some of the questions that are coming in are more, not so much about being a linguist in industry, but just being in industry. Um, in general, Sort of, uh, Ezra, I'll, I'll pose this as the final question and I'll just go down the line and ask all three of you. Sure. Linguistics aside, salary aside, what, do you, what kind of feel do you want from a job in terms of commute, in terms of office life and what's around the office? What do you look for in a job? Sure. I would say that as far as commute to handle that first, as close as possible, commuting is terrible and a car costs a lot of money. I think that's, I think, understandable. Um, I've been able to avoid having a car for my entire 20s, and I, I hope to keep it that way. Um, I would say, like, from, from an office, I would say that I want an office that not only um, do people feel comfortable communicating with each other, but there's really, really good cross-team communication. Um, there is a book that I read um, in my first job, um, thanks to Emily Pace, um, 
It's called Team of Teams. Um, it's written by General McChrystal. Um, and I think it's a really, really good example of a place that I want to work in, which is having teams that interact really, really well with each other and not being siloed within each other. And one of the things that I liked about Expert System, one of the things I like about Amazon, and I would hope to have in future roles as well, is teams that are comfortable interacting with each other and not just through choke points. I think that's something that from a corporate structural point of view is really, really important. As far as other things, just general flexibility, you know, getting, being able to get off for religious holidays, relevant to fellow Jews and definitely to Muslims as well. Um, and I would say also making it really, really clear how one moves up. I think that kind of clarity is really important. We do have that at Amazon, which has been great. Um, it doesn't always necessarily happen. So a place where if your career progresses with that particular corporation, knowing how to do it from the jump. Great. Elme, what do you look for? Okay. I think I'll be second what Ezra did, uh, said about the team. I already mentioned that earlier. For me, it's uh, who I work with and uh, how they engage with me in a non-conflictive fashion is extremely important. I like to be able to discuss whatever is going on, implementation, coding, uh, uh, problem solving in a non-conflictive manner. And uh, that's the most important uh, thing. And I want always the group uh, to be accountable as a group for whatever happens. Okay, above all in the field of engineering, when there are problems, it's collective, not single out anybody. That's very important for me, uh, dialogue, and also respect for my expertise. If somebody did not respect my expertise and deleted it in any way, well, you get, uh, I would not go for that. Uh, I would be very outspoken about it. And uh, so basically, no discrimination of any type. Fantastic. Rich, what do you look for? Um, I would definitely, you know, second the idea about uh, teams being able to work together. I think that's very important. Uh, being able to work with your teammates, you know, that these are people you can get along, not just work with them, but you have to have water cooler time, right? And so there has to be some kind of chemistry fit there as well. Um, and um, I have worked remotely for 17 years, so I don't commute. And so the fact that my company is located uh, 2,000 miles away from where I live, I don't, you know, I've been there a couple of times, but it's not a big deal. If you don't have that opportunity, you know, I would, I would look for what life is around, why, what life is like around uh, where you're working. That's why I came to Seattle. I mean, that's why I left my academic career uh, to come here. And um, so personally, if I'm looking for a company, I'm looking for a company that's going to let me stay here. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's a great point. We're living in a world, uh, world where work from home is, is uh, very popular. I've been working from home for five years. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's becoming a more of a thing. Um, all right. So we're basically at the end of our time. And so I just want to end with my kind of impression, which is all three of our panelists today have had a pretty positive experience in the industry. And I think that's a really good lesson for everyone who sat in on this to, to take away is there's a role for you. And, uh, you know, academia is suffering a lot right now. Uh, I don't know how many of you listen to academic ch uh, Twitter, but oh my God, it's, it's like a nightmare hellscape <laughs> right now. Um, I hope it's not really that bad, but it does, it sounds, uh, it sounds like industry is a heck of a good choice for a lot of linguists right now. Thank you.